Hello and welcome. Today we're working on how to calculate stock and bond returns, risk and returns, and we're going to use the data set for the last 50 years with the S&P 500 as our stocks, and the bonds would be the 10-year Treasury bonds for the United States, and then the bills would be the three-month Treasury bills. So let's get started. Hello, my name's Jeff from Finally Learn, where I help you finally learn financial literacy. So here we have 50 years of stock returns. So let's just go to the bottom here. You can see all the returns every year from 1971 to 2020. And we have the three stocks, which is the S&P 500, the bonds, which is the treasury bonds, the 10-year treasury bonds, and then three-month treasury bill. So it's really stocks, bonds, and cash, like if you have a savings account, money market account kind of thing. So let's calculate, first, let's calculate the worst five years we're gonna use conditional formatting. So let me show you how to do this. So if we highlight this row, in fact, let's name the ranges here. So we can name a range stocks. So if you go to the left of the formula bar, we can name this. So instead of having this range named B4 all the way through B54, whatever it would be, we can name it where it is called stocks. So we have the named range. Let's do another named range, bonds. And we type in bonds for that range. And then the last one, we'll do bills. So we have named ranges when we get to the formulas here. In just a minute, it'd be really, really helpful. Now, one thing we're always worried about is not just the return, but the risk. So if, you know, some people invest in stocks and they say, oh, it's so risky, or they don't invest because they think it's so risky. And so they would say, you know, you can really lose money in the stock market, and you can. So let's highlight the worst five years using a little tip called uh, conditional formatting. So let me highlight this, and we'll go to conditional formatting on the home ribbon. And let's do the top or bottom rules. We can do the bottom 10%. That would be, since it's 50, exact 50 years, the bottom 10% would be five, but let's do bottom 10 items. And we can change the 10 to five, and we can have a red or yellow or green or whatever. Red makes the most sense since it's uh, the worst returns. So let's put okay. And so what we have is our worst returns are 1973, 1974, 2001, 2002, and the worst return of all the last 50 years was 2008. The S&P 500 lost 36.5%. But if you got out, you missed several years of really good returns. So, you know, the risk does come with return. So let's do this for bonds real quickly and for bills. And we'll go on and start calculating some numbers. So the conditional formatting, we can do the bottom 10% if that is easier for you. It will calculate the worst five years. So 1987 was a bad year for treasury bonds and so on. The most recent bad year was 2013 and you lost 9%. So the returns are smaller with bonds, but the losses are smaller as well. Now the last one bills, smaller still. So we're gonna do conditional formatting and let's do the bottom 10% again with red. And you see it, these have all occurred in the last 10 years or so, just these tiny returns that essentially are zero. Now, when inflation is two or three or four, right now the inflation is about four and a half percent. So if you're getting essentially a zero percent return, you're losing purchasing power on your dollars in, in the amount of about four and a half percent. Okay, so let's look at risk and return numbers. So what I've done is I've, I've built this put the years and the stocks, and let's just assume that they uh, invested, you invested $1,000 in each of these portfolios, just 1,000 in stocks, 1,000 in bonds, 1,000 in bills, and what is your return, what's your risk, things like that. So let's get started with our stocks. We're gonna say the 1,000. In fact, let's do it this way. Let's put the 1,000 here, just so we can kind of easily get started with the 1,000 here, and we know that we invested, just so it's real simple, so if we change this to 2,000, then everything gets updated. So we know we put 2,000 in stocks, 2,000 in bonds, and 2,000 in bills. 
So our formula is going to be 2,000 times 1 plus, and then the rate of return for the stocks the very first year is 14.2%. So we're going to basically take the whatever our initial investment was times the 14% plus add the, the initial $1,000. I'm going to change that back to $1,000. So we can see if the numbers are correct. So remember 14.2%, they would earn, $1,000 would earn $142. So you know that is a 14% return on top of that. Now we can do the same thing here. We can just go across and copy it across. So it was the bond return for the first year, 9.7, and the bills return, 4.5%. Let's check, 9.7 and 4.5. So it looks like we've set up the first year correctly. Now, we can't copy that first year because we start with 1,000. And let's do the second year, and then we can copy this all the way down. Okay, for 1972, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the 1142 times, start my parentheses, 1 plus, and we'll point to the 18.76% return. So here is our percentage return, and then it grows to 1356. We should be able to copy this across, and then we should copy this down, all the way down. Remember, you can grab it by the fill handle and drag, or you can just double click. Everything should work. Let's see what our numbers are. The numbers are, if you invested in the stock market for 50 years, you have 168000 In the bond market, it's 28000 And in basically savings account or money market account, we're talking about about $9,000. So a big difference. So risk and return go together, one of the basic rules of finance. So let's figure out the future value. We know the future value is, for stocks, it's 168000 and then for bonds and bills, it's going to be significantly less. So yes, the stock market is risky, but it delivers over a long period of time, much higher returns. We can do this a couple of different ways. We can figure out the average return. And this is not really the way you would mention this, but, but just the average of those numbers. So what we can do is we can say average and start our parentheses here. And remember, we've named it stocks. So we can name this stocks and then use that in the formula. So because we have stocks as a named range, let's go back here, it's going to specify that B4 all the way through B53 or whatever that number is. So we can do it that way. Now, we can go across, copy it across, and then we can change this stocks to bonds. There's the return for bonds. And we can do this for bills also. Okay, that's completely fine. Let me show you a cool little trick using the indirect format, indirect formula here. So instead of having average, let's start up here. Average. And then I'm going to do indirect. Indirect is going to say, hey, point to the label stocks. Close parentheses for the indirect, close the parentheses for the average, and it's going to give us the same return. But here's what it does. It points, this indirect points to G4. Since we have a named range called stocks, then we can use that without having to reference that again. Now, the nice advantage here is we can now copy this across, and it changes from stocks to bonds to bills and so it's an easy way to set up a formula and just copy it across without having to change it from stocks to bonds to bills. Pretty cool little trick, right? Now, let's calculate the annualized return, which is called the CAGR or the Compounded Annual Growth Rate. Now, here I have a formula. This is kind of the old school formula. We have new school formulas in Excel, so let's do it both ways so you can see how it works. Now, to get the ending value, we're going to start with, we can just use the 168,000, that's completely fine, divided by the beginning value, we can use the 1,000 there, close that parentheses, and then above the 6 
is the caret symbol. We're going to do an exponent. So 1 divided by, now I'm going to type in 50. Generally, we don't want to type in numbers in a formula like this, but this is going to be fine. So close that parentheses and then subtract 1. So what's our annualized rate of return? In other words, what's the return you would have received if it was all smoothed out the same amount? What would make the account grow from 1,000 to 168,000? Over 50 years, it would take about a 10.8% return. Now, we should be able to copy this across. And you notice that in each case, just the simple return is lower, is higher than the compound annual growth rate. See, this one basically doesn't as assume compound interest. This one assumes compounding. And so it is a little bit lower number to calculate. And that's why we use the annualized return or the compounded annual growth rate, CAGR. Now we can do this uh, simply with an RRI function. Now sometimes what I do on a formula is use the FX button up here. We can search for RRI, brings up our formula builder. So RRI, we need the number of periods. I'm gonna type in 50. The present value is gonna be the $1,000. The future value is gonna be 168,000. And we're gonna get 10.8%. We can copy this across because it's gonna move from the 1,000 across and then 8937, and it's 50 years. So here's our rate of return for the 10 the 50 year period. Now, another thing we can do is calculate risk. So all that first section is, is all returns, but we're worried about risk and we want to have a way to quantify risk. One of the ways we quantify risk is using standard deviation. So Let's do a standard deviation just for those uh, stocks, bonds, bills. So let's do standard deviation. And the one that I'm going to use is the standard deviation dot S, which is standard deviation of the sample size. So here's what we want to do. I want to do indirect, start my parentheses, point to the word stocks, and then close that parentheses. We should be able to get a standard deviation of 16.81%. And so you're going to compare it to the other two. Now watch, remember I have a named range called stocks. Now if I call this the S&P 500, the formula will break because it's not pointing to a name that also is the named range. So it has to be stocks. If I called it stock, doesn't work. So it has to be stocks because that's what my named range is. So I can copy it across. And so what we have is, here's how you read standard deviation. Yes, stocks are more risky than bonds and bills, but we know the return is there. And so if you say, look, I am so worried about risk, then you'll end up with $28,000 rather than $168,000 or some number in between. Now, the other thing we can do is let's pick the, the five worst years. Uh, the five worst years. So we're going to use this. This function is called a small function. So let's do this. We can do small and the array is stocks, but we can do indirect and point to the name stocks, right? And we want to point then to the first, which is the absolute smallest. So we'll hit done. And we already know just based on our conditional formatting, it's negative 36.55. Now, how can we build this so we can copy it down and then we can copy it across? Well, let's look at our, our formula here. If we look at the G15, which is the stocks, we're okay for it to go right to bonds and bills, which would be H15 and I15. So what we wanna do is put a dollar sign to anchor the row 15. Now for the, um, the worst years, we want it to be in column F. So we're gonna put a dollar sign in front of the F because we want it to stay in column F and copy down one, two, three, four, five. So let's test it. I think that should do it. But if we test it, let's copy it down. We already know kind of what these numbers are, 25, negative 22 basically, negative 14, negative 11. Let's check our work. 
14, the 26. Yeah, it looks like we picked the five worst years for stocks. Okay, let's copy it across and find the five worst years for bonds and for bills. Remember, we said 11% negative return was the worst for bonds. If we copy this down, that looks like the five worst year for bonds. We can copy this down. Here are the five worst years for bills. So here's what we have. Over a long period of time, stocks provide more value. They provide more return. Yes, they're risky. They're more risky than, than bonds. But over a long period of time, your risk has been rewarded. Now, the S&P 500 is the 500 largest U.S. company. So it's a big company index. And so you're diversified if you owned an index fund that owns all the S&P 500. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.